topic today is entitled Why Christians Accept Creation and Reject Evolution. The main section of scripture that deals with creation is the first chapter of Genesis. That's the first chapter of the Christian's Bible. For many years, liberal leaders in the church have endeavoured to nullify the impact of this chapter by teaching that it's an allegory in the form of a poem written in order to satisfy the unscholarly mind concerning the origin of our planet. But my friends, I want to say that Genesis chapter 1 is the most important chapter in all this sacred book. And why is that? Because it reveals at least four things. First, it reveals the origin of our planet. Secondly, it tells us of the origin of our race, where we came from. Thirdly, it tells us of the one to whom we owe allegiance. And fourthly, it declares the one who may rightly call for our worship. Now, other scriptures written after Genesis frequently refer back to Genesis chapter 1, creation. And uh, this chapter reveals the true God and the rest of the Bible continually refers back to creation. The New Testament many times refers back to it. Jesus Christ deliberately confirmed creation in Genesis. And my friends, if Genesis 1 is erroneous, this means that the rest of Scripture must be erroneous. And Jesus Christ resorted to error in his proclamation of truth. And that must be totally rejected. Now, I note, want you to notice the majestic language of Genesis 1. And this was brought to the world's attention way back in 1969, you may recall, when the astronauts reached the moon. And as they encircled the moon, they commemorated that historic occasion by publicly reading across the vast reaches of space this first chapter of Genesis. It was magnificent. And remember the opening phrase reads, In the beginning, God. A remarkable introduction. Authoritative. Absolute. All-inclusive. Final. So simple. And yet so profound. And scripture brings to view two beginnings. This one, the beginning of our planet. And in the Gospel of John, in the New Testament, it tells us the beginning of the one who created it. For it brings to view God the Son, the one who came from eternity, who actually had no beginning. And uh, it reads, in the beginning, God, Genesis 1, 1. This reveals, my friends, the source of life. It comes from the Creator. It tells us life is not spontaneous. It cannot be produced in a test tube. And this reveals that atheism, the concept pervading the scientific realm, is false and illogical because there must be a beginning. There's got to be a beginning. And throughout nature, we're told, we, we witness time and time again that there is intelligent design. This is all through the natural world. A brilliant mind thought things out in regard to creation. Now the Bible tells us that atheism is foolishness. For well, notice what King David said under inspiration. The fool, he said, hath said in his heart, there is no God. No God. An atheist shuts his eyes to the overwhelming evidence of a divine mind that must have been at work at creation. And uh, atheism actually is a form of escape for many to dodge their accountability to a creator. 
A classic example of this is Aldous Huxley, that famous or noted intellectual. And in his book called Ways and Means, he there uh, relates why he was an atheist. He said, oh, it was quite simple. He said, Christianity got in the way of my sexual freedom. So I just dismissed it. You see, it's uh, George Bernard Shaw, that famous uh, writer, also admitted that he was an atheist for the same reason. And uh, actually, it's an attempt to escape one's moral responsibility, and in the end, it amounts to foolishness. Now, Genesis 1 also reveals that pantheism is false. What's pantheism? Pantheism is the worship of nature, that nature is God. That is pantheism. And the chapter, first chapter of Genesis declares that this is false. For it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, you see. Pantheism is not God, it was created by God. And almost all religions not based on the scriptures are riddled with pantheism. And a classic example of this is Hinduism. Hinduism has its sacred mountains, its sacred rivers, its sacred trees, its sacred animals, and even its sacred men. We find the sun worship of ancient Babylon and ancient Egypt was pantheistic. My friends, nature is not God, but nature is a revelation of God. As the psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God and how much they do. And the firmament, he said, shows his handiwork day unto day utter speech and night unto night shows knowledge. And who can dispute that? That's from Psalm 19, 1 and 2. And St. Paul, under inspiration, declared the invisible things of him, of God, from the are clearly seen. The invisible things are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. And what things? Even his eternal power and Godhead. Friends, nature speaks of the mighty power of God. And also, it declares there's a divine mind there that thought things through, you see, like the Godhead. And so coming back to Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God created. The Hebrew word for create is a word called bara. And its common meaning is to make something out of nothing. A better, perhaps, uh, perhaps a better uh, meaning is to form from previously non-existent material. The New Testament confirms this, this truth. For the Apostle Paul said in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, he said, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed or built by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Quite a scientific statement, you see. But it was not recognized until 1945. And why was that? Because, my friends, the general view of the scientific world to that time was that matter was indestructible. But with the splitting of the atom, of course, all was changed. And it was demonstrated that matter was formed from energy and that it was, matter was destructible, you see. And 3,000 years ago, the scripture declared that, indicating it indicated that, that material things were made from verbal energy, believe it or not. Notice the psalmist in his 33rd psalm says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake and it was, it was done, he commanded, and it stood fast. You see, made from verbal energy. He converted the, his verbal energy into substance, into material form. The Creator literally called our planet into existence. Literally. 
you see. You know, many years ago when I was a boy, there was a gadget available that captured the vibrations of the human voice and imprinted them on a screen or on a, on a, yes, on a screen of sand. A good voice could impress delicate patterns of trees and flowers, etc., like the natural world. So my friends, and, and I'd like to say this, that if the, if the human voice could imprint patterns of natural things, what could the voice of the Creator produce? He undoubtedly could produce the living form, you see, and that's how the scripture indicates it. Also, Genesis chapter 1 indicates or declares that creation was instantaneous. It was not an ev evolutionary process over millions of years or by growth over any period. For notice how it reads, the psalmist again, alluding to Genesis 1, says, He spoke and it was. He commanded and it stood fast. See that? Immediate creation. And in Genesis chapter 1, nine times it says, And he spake. Rather, he said, let there be, and there was. Let there be, and there was. Immediate creation, you see. That's the teaching, nine times in the first chapter of Genesis. Next, I'd like you to notice that our planet, according to this, did not break off the sun as I was taught when I was a boy at school. And I understand that throughout the British system of education, that was the teaching in the early 1900s. But with the dramatic advance, of course, in the scientific world, ere long after the splitting of the atom, science was able to determine the content of our planet and prove that its interior was not molten, but uh, was solid. As the United States Geological Survey reported, quote, Earthquake waves from hydrogen bomb explosions show that the Earth has an inner core 800 miles deep and solid. The Earth is like a giant hard-boiled egg with a nickel-iron yolk some 4,000 miles in diameter. So we have a very uh, solid interior of our planet. Now, the next thing I'd like you to notice is that in Genesis 1, 1, it says, God created the heaven and the earth. What is heaven? It's mentioned here. My friends, scholars differ on what this heaven involves. In fact, there are four opinions. Some declare it means the whole universe. Others declare it's our Milky Way system. Still others declare it's our solar system. Others that it's the atmospheric heaven of our particular planet. I want to suggest to you why it would not be or could not be the entire universe. We find that the world's creation, beings from other worlds rejoiced, showing that there were other worlds in existence prior to the creation of our planet. For notice what the words are of God are, 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 are recorded in connection with the uh, servant Job, the patriarch Job, mentioned in the Old Testament. And it says, the Lord says to Job, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. What's this mean? My friends, other scriptures show that the stars of God represents the angels. And the sons of God is an allusion to the leaders of other worlds, unfallen worlds. Remember, the Bible has always taught that the great universe of God is filled with intelligent life. We are not the only uh, life-filled planet in the universe. It is full of life, intelligent life. And here it indicates that at the creation of our world, there was great rejoicing on the part of others, showing, you see, that 
at the creation of Gen Genesis 1-1, it did not involve the entire universe, you see. Uh, now, what about the Milky Way system? Could it have involved that? My friends, the Milky Way system is so vast, it's, it takes light to travel across it 30,000 years. It is 30,000 light years across. That's the vastness of our Milky Way system. And uh, our solar system is a minute part of that system. The Milky Way is one of the island universes that roll through space. Millions of them, my friends, rolling through space. And some, are, some assert that because of the vast size of the Milky Way, it would take light thousands of years to reach us in our location in the Milky Way system. Therefore, the heaven of Genesis 1 could not include the Milky Way. Now, in the light of this assertion, it's of interest to note an alternative viewpoint on the part of a conservative Presbyterian scholar, Dr. Edward J. Young. And he declares this, he says this, Why could not God, in the twinkling of an eye, have formed the stars so that their light could be seen from the earth? And it's true, my friends, the Creator could have bring the, brought the light from the other stars, from the Milky Way system and anywhere, in a flash to our earth on the first day of creation. For the, remember, the scripture says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. You see, that could have been so. He could have brought the light of the Milky Way to the earth in a moment instead of thousands of years. Now, what then of our solar system? Could the solar system be the heavens that were created on day one? My friends, it's quite a possibility. It could have been the solar system. But some say, but were not the stars created on the fourth day of creation? According to verse 16, not according to the original Hebrew. For notice how the Hebrew reads, verse 16, Instead of saying, in the, as our version gives it, he made the stars also, this is how it reads, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, the stars also, unquote, meaning that the stars also rule the night, which we know is so true. You see, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were created on day four, you see. And, um, but many ask, were not the sun and the moon created on day four of creation, according to Genesis 1? Well, verse 16 says of this chapter, and God made two great lights. The Hebrew word therefore made is different from create. It's or saw, which means accomplish, advance, appoint, according to Dr. Strong. This is a different word from create, bara. And in Genesis chapter 2, there are two words that are employed in the, in the making of our planet. And this is brought to view in Genesis 2, verse 3, where it says, He, God, rested from all his work which God created and made. Get that? Created and made. And when it speaks of the, of the um, sun and the moon, etc., on day four, it says they were made, you see? Made, not created. They weren't called into existence on that day. And uh, the... Uh, the uh, we suggest that on day one, God created the heavens and the earth, whatever heaven was included. But on day four, he appointed or set up the solar system, the, 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 our system, the lighting system of the planet. That's what he did on day four. He appointed it. He set up the lighting system, you see, which uh, I understand from the viewpoint of science is very 
complicated indeed. So then, when did Genesis 1 verse 1 occur? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When did this occur? The popular view is that a time gap exists between verse 1 and 2. This could amount to millions of years, and it enables one to include the evolutionary concept in regard to the age of the earth. It also makes room for what is called the ruin and restoration theory. This is the theory made popular by Schofield's Bible that the original creation went wrong due to Lucifer's defection and that the creator was required to restore the earth to its original state. And this, re this uh, position, this view, originated in the 19th century among German Jesuit theologians and uh, was made popular by uh, Schofield's Bible, as you probably know. So the question is, is there a gap in Genesis 1, verses 1 to 3? Is there a gap there, as is claimed? Some say the gap's between verses 1 and 2. Others say the gap is between 2 and 3. So is there a gap? They claim that the first act of creation was the creation of light, in verse 2, or, so, or verse 3. Now, to answer this, we need to analyse Genesis 1, verse 2. And I want you to notice what it says. And uh, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, Dr. Edward Young, who is a fine Hebraist, says, quote, There is an emphasis in the Hebrew that is not retained in the King James Version, but is retained in the Septuagint and the Latin Vulgate. And what is this emphasis? Notice, here they are. The first one, and it reads, Now the earth was without form and void. That is, after creation, on day one, it says, Now the earth was without form and void. It connects it with verse 1, you see, to verse 2 with verse 1. The Latin Vulgate reads, The earth, moreover, was without form and void. So you notice these two versions correctly tie verse 2 to verse 1 of Genesis 1, you see, showing that when they were created, they were without form and void immediately at creation. Dr. Zimmerman, in his work, Darwin, Evolution and Creation, makes this statement. He says in 1948, at Winona Lake School of Theology, M. Henkel polled 20 leading scholars of the Hebrew language in the USA. They were asked, is there any exegetical evidence for the view that there was a gap between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1? Their reply was an emphatic no. That's from page 53 and 54 of that volume that I just quoted. So, my friends, next question. Does Scripture uphold a 6,000-year-old creation or age for the earth, our earth, the biblical records confirm an approximate age of 6,000 years. A close study of the Old Testament genealogies, lists, uh, the geological lists, produces approximately 4,000 years from Adam to Christ, you see. And the 2,000 years since then gives us 6,000 years. But now what about the objection that's been proclaimed for quite a few years, that um, in the gene genealogical list of St. Luke in chapter 3 of his Gospel, there is an extra Canaan, an extra name that is not in the Old Testament lists. And on that ground, it's concluded that the Old Testament lists were not complete and that therefore are not reliable in estimating the Old Testament eras, you see. What's the answer to this, my friends? And uh, in those, in those um, genealogical lists of the Old Testament, 
the second Canaan is missing. It's only recorded in the Gospel of Luke. So are the Old Testament geological, genealogical lists incorrect? Or is there something wrong with Luke chapter 3? The popular claim is that the Old Testament lists are faulty. Faulty, you see. So how are we going to solve this problem? This is just human opinion, you see. How are we going to solve it? The scripture answers this. Six times at least, the scripture tells us, lays down this rule, in the mouth of two or three witnesses is a thing established. That means that a truth must be stated at least two or three times for it to be acceptable. You see that? And if you apply that rule, my friends, it, it uh, solves a lot of problems. And remember, Jesus Christ himself declared this. He said, in, as recorded in Matthew 18, verse 16, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now, let's apply this. We find there's only one mention of the second Canaan, and that's in Luke 3. So the fact there's only one mention, my friends, it therefore is not authoritative. There's something wrong. But on the other hand, the records that declare or reveal there's only one Canaan, there's at least three, which indicates that that is established. So we, are, we, are, we accept the Old Testament lists, genealogical lists, because they are established, because there's three of them, at least three, you see. So how do we pro explain this problem in Luke 3? And the answer is, my friends, that it can be shown that originally Luke's list did not contain the extra Canaan. It is a copyist's error, a later copyist's error. You see, originally it was not there. And many sound authorities through the years have rejected the second Canaan. Dr. Adam Clark, that learned Methodist commentator, Matthew Henry, perhaps the oldest statesman of Bible commentators, Jamison Fawcett and Brown, the pulpit commentary, Professor Sace of Oxford University, learned professor of Oriental Archaeology of the 19th century, Dr. Leroy Froome's monumental work, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, all those past authorities reject the second Canaan. And we find that sound current scholars confirm it, confirm that there is no second Canaan. Dr. Jonathan Safati, or Safati of um, Answers in Genesis. Remember that fine organisation originally called Creation Science. Uh, he has presented uh, indisputable evidence for the rejection of the second Canaan. And uh, his organisation must be highly recommended for its sound scientific contribution to the defence of Scripture. So then, Next question, what about modern radiometric dating methods, which are so popular today? For many years, some recognised scientists have admitted that over long periods of time, this method is not reliable. Notice this, way back in the 1960s, Dr John Conant, a name recognised in the scientific world, he declared there are grave doubts whether we can depend on the uniformity of the behaviour of matter over such enormous periods of time." Unquote. Another authority, Kurt Teichert, has, has declared, quote, no coherent picture of Earth history can be gained from radioactive dating methods. Unquote. And that's from the Bulletin of the Geological Society of America, January 1968. I remember way back in 1967, you may recall the, there was a, an, a volcanic eruption in the North Atlantic near Iceland. And uh, 
As a result, a small island arose out of the sea. It was named Circe. And after a few years, as dust, etc., began to accumulate on it, uh, vegetation began to appear. And in the 1970s, a group of scientists went across to Circe in order to check the age of the new rocks. And to their surprise, their tests indicated that the rocks were many millions of years of age. And yet all knew that those rocks were just a few years old. So my friends, that tells us that in, in fact, the dating methods, these uh, these uh, geologic, these uh, radiometric methods of dating are not really reliable. Uh, creation, the Creation Science Organisation, which is now called Answers in Genesis in Australia, uh, it is comprised of reputable scientists who are earnest Christians. And their aim is to uphold the Bible as being scientifically accurate. They freely offer first-class, up-to-date scientific evidence to show that the evolutionary argument for the age of the earth will not stand up. Thank God for that organisation. Now, Genesis 1 declares that God's creative acts resulted in mature, complete productions. Notice how it reads, Genesis 1.31, And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was complete, very good. And Hebrews 4, chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, commenting on creation, says, The works were finished from the foundation of the world. You see that? When God created it, th those things, they were finished, they were complete, they were mature. The rocks, the mountains and seas, vegetation, animal, bird, insect, sea and human life were all perfect and complete. For example, take the first man, Adam. When he was created, he was a magnificent physical specimen. If he had undergone scientific analysis, they probably would have declared that he was in perfect manhood, about 25 years of age. But in fact, he was only about 24 hours of age. He was created, complete, perfect, mature, as was all the rest of creation. That's the teaching of Genesis 1. And uh, next, Genesis 1 indicates that creation was completed in six 24-hour days. Notice what it says in the Ten Commandments. It says, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Exodus 20, verse 11. In six days. And friends, there are indisputable scientific reasons why those days must have been 24 hours in length. There are at least 10 proofs that those days must have been 24 hours in length. The first one is that plant life demands a 24 hour cycle of light and darkness. Otherwise, all vegetation would perish. And if those days were long periods of time, of light and darkness, no vegetable or animal life could survive. That's the first reason. The second one, plant life is dependent on pollination by insects for reproduction. But insects were not created until the sixth day. If these days were long periods, there'd be no insects or pollination and vegetation again would perish. The third point, vegetation requires sunlight, but the sunlight was not present till the fourth day. If these days were long periods of time or vegetation again would die for lack of sunlight. 
Four, the Earth rotates on its axis every 24 hours. This is vital for controlling and maintaining the temperature of our planet. If the Earth's rotation decreased to one-tenth of its current speed, the length of daylight and darkness would increase tenfold, according to science. And the result, the sun would burn up all vegetation by day, and at night all vegetation would be destroyed by the extreme cold. My friends, life on this planet demands a 24 hour cycle. The fifth reason, the age of Adam indicates that the days must have been 24 hour days because it says Adam was formed on day six of creation. If the days were long periods of time, then Adam at death would have been thousands of years of age. But according to Genesis 5, 3 to 5, Adam died at 9.30 years of age, a great age admitted, but not sufficient, my friends, to fit in with a long period of time, as some claim. And the sixth reason, the wording of the fourth commandment speaks of 24 hours. Notice, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and all that in them is and rested on the seventh day, Exodus 20. 8 to 11. How long was the seventh day? Notice in the same, the next verse, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. The word day there is the same as the word for day when it speaks of creation. You see that? In both verses. So if the six working days were 24 hours in length, it's logical to conclude that the six days of creation, you see, were also 24 hours in length. Number seven. In scripture, if the word day is affixed by a number, it always means 24 hours. And this is the verdict of the scholars. The word day, of course, in scripture has several applications. There's a day of salvation. There's the day of judgment. There's the day of the Lord. There's the day of, judge, a day of judgment. And also there's uh, what is spoken of as a prophetic day, a day in prophecy, a symbolic day, you see. But according to sound Hebrew scholars, when a number is attached to the word day, except in symbolic prophecy, it always means a 24-hour day. So that's the seventh reason why the days must be 24 hours. The eighth reason, the day's length is determined by the sun. The sun pulls the earth around, as we all know, on its axis. And science declares that, quote, the speed of the earth on its axis has never varied by even one thousandth of a second over the last 1,000 years. Just imagine. My friends, the earth and the sun were set in position on the fourth day of creation. If there is no variation in the earth's axis speed, even to a thousandth of a second, cannot we logically conclude that on the first day when those bodies were set in position, that their speed would be the same as today? We can. And this probability strongly suggests that the days of creation must have been 24 hours in length. Number nine, reputable Hebrew dictionaries confirm that those days of Genesis 1 were 24 hour days. They do not allow the word day in Genesis 1 to be a long period. And the following dictionaries declare it. Bull, Brown, Driver, and Koenig. Simpson, as Hebrew authority, says the word day in Genesis is not a long geological period. Marcus Dodds, another Hebrew authority, he says if the word day in these chapters does not mean a period of 24 hours, the interpretation of Scripture is hopeless. There it is. Reputable 
Hebrew dictionaries. Notice the response of modern scholars in connection with this. In 1957, Arthur C. Constance wrote to nine Hebrew scholars, all members of nine leading universities, three in the USA, three in Canada, and three in England. His question, do you consider the Hebrew word yom as used in Genesis 1, accompanied by a numeral to be properly translated as a, a day as commonly understood, b, an age, c, an age or a day without preference for either. Seven of the nine scholars replied, and all seven were in full agreement that the word, quote, the word yom or day in Genesis 1 means a day as commonly understood, unquote. And that comes from Arthur C. Constance between the lines and analysis of Genesis, Doorway Papers, number 11, Ottawa, Canada, 1957, page 30. And finally, my friends, let me bring to your attention the fact that throughout nature there exist marvellous time clocks in the natural world, time clocks. And these are set to 12 or 24 hour periods. Richie Ward, in his book, The Living Clocks, page 7, in the preface, says this, Organisms, from one-celled plants to man, either are endowed with, or perhaps are, living clocks. And of course, all this has been scientifically proved. He says there are rhythmic cycles or biological rhythms. They are found in man, animals, birds, fish, insects, and plants. In man, there are over 100 internal rhythms. Most are in cycles of 24 hours. Man's body runs in 24 hour cycles. He is key to a natural succession of day and night, 12-hour rhythms. How about that? In plant life, there are 12-hour rhythms or cycles. In one-celled marine life, they run on rhythms of 12 hours. In birds, they possess not only internal time clocks, but also possess a sun compass. How about that? Living beings possess a chemical clock, a pacemaker. Flying squirrels, for instance, have 24-hour internal clocks. Honeybees possess time clocks geared to 24-hour rhythms. And they also possess a sun compass. Honeybees, marvellous. Cockroaches possess time clocks of 24-hour cycles. Amazing. My friends, all these marvels of nature confirm Genesis chapter 1. All things were created and brought forth in six 24-hour days. They established the truth of the fourth commandment, which says, in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. They also confirm the first angel's message brought to light in the 14th chapter of Revelation. And this message, my friends, is the final message to the world before the coming of Christ. And it calls mankind back to the worship of the Creator in preparation for the second advent very, very significant. And so, my friends, this naturally means the rejection of evolution and the acceptance of our great Creator. As it says, worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. 
May God help us to indeed come to the place where we do worship the great creator is my sincere prayer.